uh, how we're each going to address those, especially as we try to reopen, being the fact that um, uh, we share more potentially in common with our friends in West Virginia and Pennsylvania than we do uh, on down the road. But uh, we're going to get those. Uh, I'm working, uh, communicated with the sim manager of, of Chambersburg, and we're going to work together to try to come up with that and toss some ideas about uh, amongst us. Um, you all are also aware um, of uh, this um, <clears throat> salute to heroes um, parade or procession or whatever you want to call it uh, that I think we need to, to talk a little bit about. Um, gotten some more clarification as the day has gone on uh, once we found out about it yesterday. Uh, the original communication apparently went out just to the companies. It didn't go out to any of the Hagerstown Fire Department uh, management. It was more of a, uh, there's more confusion about what the purpose of this procession was. Uh, is it, you know, was it to recognize our public safety folks? Um, what was what was the, the need? And I know there was some concern amongst some in public safety that they didn't want this to be a self-aggrandizing, aggrandizing word um, for them because, you know, they're not in this alone. We all, we all respect and admire and appreciate what public safety does, but uh, they also feel that there's more to this than just that. Um, so um, there's apparently some communications being made uh, by the county uh, to each of the companies, and that includes the companies, the five companies in Hagerstown, uh, to clarify that this is more of a thank you to uh, our residents as well as a thank you to uh, those working on the front lines of this crisis uh, as a way to recognize as a way to recognize their uh, their contribution as kind of a, a mutual back and forth of a, of a thank you. Uh, it's scheduled for Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, that's what the communication has said, and and I think there's attempts out there by the county to try to clarify to each of the of the committee or each of the uh, companies what we're trying to do here. Um, I let you all know about it because we didn't know about it as a as a management group uh, that it, that this was actually going to happen until yesterday. So uh, I, I've been told that uh, our our departments can can do this. We just you know got a little bit more of an issue being we're in Hagerstown. How do we go about doing this? And it's it's just become a it's kind of become a little bit of a, a quandary for us. And I just wanted to provide you guys the information so um, you could discuss it. It's something we we want to participate in. Do we not? How do we do it? So um, I'll leave that up to either you all uh, to discuss now, or you can discuss it when you get to your comments. One way or another is fine with me. In, in, in support of this notion. Uh, uh, in one part, I don't think that our citizenry are going to, to view uh, the touring of public safety vehicles through uh, a number of, uh, or, or just a few, uh, random uh, city streets as, as some process of, of, you know, appreciation or accolade. Um, I, I just have some, some difficulty in, in making the connection uh, and the rationale uh, between one and the other. Uh, the, the, the second though is um, a Saturday afternoon seems a little odd. Uh, you know, um, in, in the fact that, that somebody's gonna make calls, uh, largely those calls uh, in, if they're in the city, the calls are gonna try and, and, and come in from residents to to um, city departments uh, who aren't going to be there because uh, it's Saturday uh, uh, to answer uh, and um, you know which is then going to start the the the, the social media chatter uh, you know that that we'll have to sort of uh, respond to and then to have it occur as randomly as uh, the latest email which I saw which showed three out of 27 uh, companies uh, have, have confirmed participation, uh, none of which are, are within any geographical proximity uh, to one another. Uh, I just, 
I'm trying to, to wrap my head around, you know, I guess the, the logistics issue, uh, the citizen oriented uh, 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 optics of it, I, and trying to figure out how that uh, how that plays out. I, I, I don't, I honestly don't disagree with you, uh, Councilman. Um, it, it, this is, is still kind of nebulous to us. I think it's obviously nebulous to at least 24 of the other uh, companies that, that may not have responded to the county at the time. Um, so uh, I, I honestly don't have an answer for you. Uh, I was hoping that uh, we might be able to get a little bit more clarification um, today or tomorrow. Uh, but honestly, the logistics of this thing, we're more than a one street town and how we would, uh, you know, try to make sure that we got uh, the companies around into their areas is one thing. I, we could do it. I don't have, I don't have a, a, a doubt that, that we, could, we could do this and do it right. I just, um, it, it's, it's three days away, basically. That was my, my biggest concern. And, and I guess as it applies to the rationale, uh, the, the, the rationale part of it. Yes. I mean, obviously, we all get the the, the sit rep uh, reports you know, from the EOC on on a, a fairly daily basis. I don't know how many folks uh, actually read them, uh, you know, in their entirety. But you know, I asked the question. Uh, uh, before and I asked it again recently. You know, th those are reports that aren't supposedly, I guess, aren't aren't for public consumption. They're not shared with the public, and I understand the, the logistics of some of the contact information and things like that. But most of the bulk of that, that the rest of that information appears to be, in my opinion, exactly the type of information we should be sharing with the public through the entire course uh, of 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 the event. Uh, uh, of which we, we haven't uh, uh, really, and, and we've been sort of told, you know, this isn't the, the information, you know, uh, to be made available. And instead, I feel like we're going to do this uh, more what I'll call ceremonious, although I, I, I'm not sure, you know, the, the, the link between that and, and, uh, and the current events. I just I'm struggling a little bit to understand why we're foregoing sharing actual reassuring data and information with the public on the regular basis that I think that that the public needs to to, to hear and see and 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 you know uh, take some assurance from and instead you know doing measures such as this that that I don't think uh, uh, resonate as directly and impactfully. Uh, uh, with the, with the public, um, you know, to 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 indicate that that the measures being taken are are uh, you know uh, showing results. Understood. No, I I, I understand. Um, the only thing I that I would I could tell you and would suggest to everybody would be that tomorrow during the municipality call that the EOC does. I can't imagine this won't be a major topic, uh, being the, the, the municipalities that take part in that. Uh, and again, I think that's, you know, that's another venue to, to bring up what you, what you talk about as well. I, again, I, I, would, I, would not, I would be remiss to say, I don't have those same concerns uh, at times as well, Councilman, and as to wondering, you know, what gets out, what doesn't. Um, but, um, I, I just don't, I don't have those answers for you because I'm, I just, I'm not that intimate with the EOC and, and their process. Kristen, can you give me an example of information that you think does not get out to the general public that, that, that are in these, um, these emails? I mean, I, you know, I read them and then I read the same thing, you know, online, I read it in the paper, I read, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, what what isn't getting out there that you have a concern about? Sure. Um, let's take the example of of uh, the ventilator uh, uh, process. Uh, you know, the number of of, of available uh, ventilators that 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 are are on hand, and the 
uh, ongoing ratio of, of those devices that are in use at any one time uh, is an example. So, so you know, we've had reports that there's 50 uh, available, and, uh, you know, we've seen reports uh, at times where there, there's two in use, three in use, I think four is probably the maximum number. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's one example. I know two weeks ago, uh, Delegate Quarterman, uh, at one of our uh, uh, discussions, asked the question of whether individuals under the age of 18 are being administered uh, testing. Uh, and I believe the answer at that time was no. Um, and so, so that was uh, a piece of information that uh, appeared um, new uh, uh, to me. Uh, also, you know, I've asked the question twice now, and I think Lou has has commented as well. Uh, you know, we get a daily briefing document that is sent to roughly a hundred folks, uh, and I've asked the question: you know, Is is this a document for public consumption? And the answer has clearly uh, been received that it is not. Um, and uh, one of the one of the documents we got. Uh, yesterday indicated, you know, what to do. And I sent you guys this email that says, you know, uh, folks that are sick should wear, should wear, should wear a mask. And I read that to mean that that is a recommendation function only. Uh, and so that, that begged the question in my mind, uh, you know, is, is that the case or isn't it? Because the directive that we've received is that, uh, that they are a requirement, uh, and not, not a recommendation. And so, uh, you know, and I could go, you know, into any one of these documents and, and, and pick out, you know, uh, pieces of information. Uh, and I think for me, it is largely uh, more the, the the parameters in the 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 breadth of which we, we share it and are, you know, getting it out um, for 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 that public consumption. I mean, I had that conversation. Uh, with, with some joint staff, you know, several weeks ago, where I said, "Hey, you know, we're going to need to to see some 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 stats, you know, over the next few weeks to to show some of these positive results." Um, and I don't know where uh, the disconnect is between uh, the briefings that, that that we get and then the information that is being administered to the public, and I don't know what avenues that information is being administered to the public uh, through, uh, because obviously in the past month we've gotten, and, and you know, clearly, the, you know, th there's documentation of this where, uh, you know, uh, reporters uh, felt they were not given some information, uh, and, and, you know, we have sites uh, that provide some information, and so, you know, I, I think that, that it's practical that I have those questions when I'm reading things that aren't, you know, what I would say are, are part of the norm of the, the you know, uh, uh, the public conversation. Bob, if I, if I could add, <clears throat> excuse me, and make it a, a lot shorter and more succinct. Um, I would like it now may not be the time to be getting it. This may be an after action report. Okay. But at some stage of the game, I would like, at first I thought five things, but instead I'll take it down to just one. Since these briefings and these mailings have begun, I would like EOC to identify just one single fact that we have been told that they don't think the public should know about because you raised an interesting point when you said, what do the public don't know? Well, we get these briefings and these mailings every day, and we're told they're totally confidential. And the same day, I'm seeing it all over the social media and the news. Um, so why are they confidential? I do not comprehend why they're confidential. And I also, and, and you know this, Mayor, how many times have we been told that the five of us or three of us can't be together because it's an open meeting and we're violating open meeting laws. Now, five of us at the mayor are in meetings where we do things. We're invited to comment. 
And we're not going into executive session. We're not doing anything. We're just having meetings and we're being told that's okay suddenly. Before, heck, if three of us wanted to, to meet with uh, somebody about the stadium, that was a meeting. So we couldn't do it together. So I just don't understand this whole confidentiality bit. And I would like to know just one single item the EOC thinks the public should not know that. Well, I can tell you that I read those emails and those briefing updates, and I, I've I've never seen anything on there that the public shouldn't know. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have that answer. Again, tomorrow on the uh, municipal phone call, uh, hopefully some will chime in and express their concerns and see if we can't. Uh, you know, change change how that happens. Is that it from you, Scott? I'll save my shout outs to the end, Mayor. Thank you. All right, next up, I, was there anybody else? Sorry, Kelly, you wanna say something? Well, I was, I don't know if we ever really confirmed what we were or were not doing with this so-called parade. I guess, you know, my, I'm concerned just like Kristen that it's like the last minute and do we have enough time to pull something off? Um, without looking, making it look tacky, or I mean, we could, and then field a couple phone calls. But you know, like the thing that the Washington County Maryland fire calls on Facebook said that it was a salute to heroes, and that was yesterday afternoon. And now it's all changing. So there's like this incredibly conflicting information. So it it could look. Are we going to look poorly if we don't participate? I guess that's the that's my question. You know, is it going to look really bad on the city if we don't do something that doesn't exactly make sense anyway? <laughs> I'll, I'll throw my two cents in. I, I I I like the idea, but I think it needs to be planned better. I think if if we had you know the fire trucks and the police cars and the ambulances going through town. And they had a big banner on the side that said, uh, you know, Hagerstown Emergency Response Team, salute you, our citizens. We'll get through this together. And, I mean, on a Saturday afternoon, every kid in the city will be out, you know, watching the fire trucks go by and everything else. So it, it, it would be a really nice thing. But we don't have time to put banners together. Uh, you know, this, I, I don't know what the, what the, uh, what, what the, the three-day, thing is why, why does it have to be this weekend why can't we plan it and do it right i i'd like to bring this up tomorrow too uh, in the, at the municipality meeting because obviously we're not the only ones that have this concern if there were 24 others or you know besides us 25 others or 24 others that didn't respond also because obviously they've got questions as well so um i would like to bring this up tomorrow i i, I agree with everything you're saying i would want to do it the right way um, and I'm, I'm just a little concerned that having five companies in Hagerstown um, on a, trying to arrange all this, you know, with streets and, and figuring all that logistics out, we could we would do it if we, if we had to do it. Um, but it, it, it would certainly be a, a chore. We we got a lot of stuff going on as it is. So that that I'd like to talk about this more with the group tomorrow. All right, sounds good to me, and um, you know, we'll uh, try to try to piece it together somehow. Either we will have something this weekend, or we won't have something this weekend. But um, w whatever it is, it's got to be um, transmitted out there that you know we're not opposed to doing uh, a salute to heroes, but you know, it's uh, we want to make sure we do it right. We don't want to have you know. Yeah. So anyway. Um, so, uh, is, is that it then from everybody on, you know, the COVID-19 update? Be careful with audio glitches, Mayor. Thank you, Scott. All right, next up is, uh, there's two proclamations. One is Preeclampsia Awareness Month, and the other is Building Safety Month. I'm going to read through them real fast. Uh, unfortunately, there's no one here to accept the proclamation for preeclampsia awareness month, but I'm going to read the proclamation anyway. Uh, so preeclampsia awareness month, May 2020, whereas preeclampsia, including help syndrome, H-E-L-L-P, and eclampsia is a dangerous condition of pregnancy that can 
in its severest form lead to maternal and or infant mortality or premature birth with significant health risk for the mother and baby. And whereas preeclampsia affects three to 4% of pregnancies in the United States and four to 5% of pregnancies worldwide, there are 6.5 deaths in every 10,000 cases of preeclampsia. And whereas public education as to the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, and eclampsia can help women recognize the condition and seek appropriate medical care. And whereas prenatal education should include recognition of those signs and symptoms, spikes in maternal blood pressure, sudden swelling of face and hands, severe upper abdominal, abdominal pain, blurred vision, persistent headaches, and breathlessness. And whereas many citizens of Vagerstown have joined the Preeclampsia Foundation to raise public awareness in order to minimize maternal and infant illness and death due to preeclampsia. Now, therefore, I, Robert E. Burchett II, second mayor of the city of Hagerstown, Maryland, to hereby proclaim May 2020 as Preeclampsia Awareness Month in Hagerstown, Maryland, and support the Preeclampsia Foundation's efforts to reduce maternal and infant illness and mortality due to preeclampsia and related hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. All right, and that's is a building safety month is May. And the proclamation reads, whereas the city prioritizes safety issues of the utmost importance in existing and newly built structures and environments occupied by those who live, work, play, learn, worship, and visit our community. Whereas our confidence in the integrity of these buildings that make up our community is, achieved, is achieved through the dedication of the building officials, fire prevention officials, licensed design professionals, licensed trans, tradespeople, developers, building owners, and property managers who design, construct, inspect, and maintain new architecturally unique and diverse properties within our corporate limits. And whereas these partners, who as members of the International Code Council, implement the codes of the state that protect our citizenry to include the international codes. And whereas these international codes, as the most widely adopted building safety, energy, and fire prevention codes in the nation, are used by most U.S. cities, counties, and states. These modern building codes also include safeguards to protect the public from national disasters such as hurricanes, snowstorms, tornadoes, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind everyone of the critical role of local code officials to assure we have safe, energy efficient, and livable buildings. And whereas the Building Safety Month is a time for everyone to be aware of the importance of safe and resilient construction, fire prevention, disaster mitigation, and new technologies in the construction industry, and to be encouraged to take the appropriate steps necessary to ensure that our built environment and places for all activities are safe for every participant. And whereas Building Safety Month is observed to recognize that lives have been saved through the implementation of codes, acknowledge the service provided by our local agencies and encourage each citizen to consider where they may improve building safety in their residence or workplace. Now, therefore, uh, Robert E. Bridget II, Mayor of the City of Hagerstown, Maryland, you proclaim the month of May 2020 as Building Safety Month and encourage our citizens to improve building safety and resiliency at home and in the community and to acknowledge the essential service provided by local and state building departments and federal agencies in protecting lives and property. And uh, Pam, you wanted to uh, wanted to do something. Uh, Pam Harris, on behalf of the Planning and Code Administration staff, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Safety in the built environment is an essential component of maintaining public health and making our community more resilient to natural disasters. We we'll encourage everyone to join us and virtually through social media and digital educational materials on our website. <laughs> okay. Is that good, Pam? You good? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. All right, next up, wireless payment option for metered parking stalls. Eric Dyke, Director of Public Works, Jason Rogers, Parking Supervisor, and Jennifer Tankle uh, from Pay by Phone. You on the line there, Jen? 
Hello, thank you so much. And I will go ahead and share my webcam. And also with me today is Adam Kriegel. So, and he will be, yeah, I see you, Adam. Um, be there. Hi, Adam. Hi, guys. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> Council. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How you doing, Jen? So, doing well, thank you. And so how, um, should we go ahead and start with the, the presentation or? Sure. Okay, Aaron, I'm gonna, if you want to run this? I'm going to do a little bit here and then we'll get started. I'll get you uh, ready to go here. So, I'm sorry, so yeah, I'm so sorry, I didn't touch that. Um, let me uh, jump in here real quick, Jen, and then we'll get you started here in a moment, okay? Perfect, yeah, so we're going to talk you. about the wireless payment option um, uh, for meter park installs, whether the meters are uh, on the street or in a parking lot. And um, with me, as you said, Mayor was the, uh, is Jason Rogers, a parking system supervisor, and, and Jen and Adam from Pay by Phone. So we actually went out on the street on this back in October, which has been a long time ago. And we had a number of uh, vendors respond. Uh, they were um, Flowbird and Pango, uh, park mobile and pay by phone. Pay by phone is one of the original uh, actually pay by phone systems that was actually uh, programs or companies that was put together. And after the bid, we, uh, this is a little unusual. It's not so much usually you're bidding something where you're paying a vendor or paying a contractor. In this case, um, it had to do more with the service they're providing. All the, uh, all the companies provided a similar service, not exactly the same, but similar um, programs and such. And uh, so we interviewed each one of them, uh, Jason and I, along with our consultant. And um, in the end, we decided uh, pay by phone had the, had the uh, features and such that we liked. Um, one of which was uh, towards the end of what they did was uh, waived all the fees. Um, for us, it's virtually um, uh, no cost to the city of Hagerstown. Uh, the end user will, will pay the fees, which Jen and Adam will talk about and um, provide signage and all that sort of thing uh, to get us up and running and do the promotion. So that's kind of the, just a real brief overview of the real quick. Jen, if you want to go ahead and, and uh, go through the program and explain what exactly this is. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much. And just before I jump in, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Oh, great. Sounds yes. good. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, formally, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to virtually introduce Pay by Phone. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Jen Pankel and I am the Director of Sales for the Mid-Atlantic. And also joining me today is Adam Kriegel, who is our, our Vice President for the East Coast. And so Adam and I had met with Hagerstown back in January. And so we're, we're quite excited for this opportunity to share more about the Pay by Phone company, our brand, uh, product, our team, et cetera. And so without further ado, I'll jump into the agenda on the next slide. And, and everyone can still see this, is that right? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. So here's a, a brief outline of what we'll be discussing on this call. So I'll quickly introduce more about the team and chat more about the company that is pay by, pay by phone, provide a demo of the user experience that Parker's in Hagerstown will experience when they use our app. And lastly, how we ensure our city partners are set up for success with our marketing and adoption efforts. And uh, we should be able to keep this under 10 minutes and allow for some Q&A at the end. Um, but before I advance to the next slide, I do want to call attention to the image on the right, which is what we call our dynamic label. And so when Parker's launched the pay by phone app in the city of Hagerstown, uh, an image or message of the city's choice will be on the landing page uh, in the app. And so even though Parkers might download this one pay by phone app that's used by 35 million users across the globe, uh, the app will feel like it's Hagerstown, Hager, Hagerstown's own uniquely branded app. And I'll provide a real life example of how our client, the city of Atlanta is utilizing the dynamic label capability in a few slides uh, down, down the road. So jumping into the pay by phone team. So one of the reasons why I love this company so much is because of the incredible group of people that I get to work with that are my teammates. And so there's about 400 or so um, and counting across the world. Um, we're still very much hiring and growing. And up on the left, as you can see, are some of us at the International Parking and Mobility 
Institute conference that took place last year in Anaheim. And so we attend every single uh, parking and mobility events, whether that's a local workshop or an international trade show, uh, which means that as your partner, um, we're just continuously hearing about what's the latest, what the, the, the next best solutions are, you know, even if it's outside of the mobile app technology. So um, to the note of parking associations, I'm a board director of the Mid-Atlantic Parking Association. And more importantly, I reside in Washington, D.C. As you can see, the bottom right is my dog outside the Capitol in my neighborhood. So um, I'm very much local and accessible. So for any type of training, marketing, brainstorming discussion uh, that the city might have, I'm very much um, you know, accessible and, and ready to hop over there. I believe it was an hour drive last time um, that, that we came through. Okay, and so now uh, enough about me. If Adam, you want to just believe I should be able to start this clip. Yeah, this we have just Jen, a very short. Jen, Jen's brilliant way to keep me contained is keeping me to a one minute video. If she had given me slides, I can talk all day, but now I have a one minute video to speak <laughs> over and uh, a great chance to kind of overview some of the features um, that we would normally demo in person. When I encourage people to check this out yourself, you can check out the app in the app store, but this is what the map looks like. You can choose a location on the map. The languages are all native. So whatever your iPhone or Android is, is set up to be in that language, the pay by phone app will already respond there, but you don't actually need to download the app or register an account. We do allow for guest sessions. So it is easier just like any other app when you prepay, uh, pre-store all your info so you can pay immediately. But um, we make the user interface as easy and seamless as possible so they can extend from anywhere and remain in contact with their parking session. We also have access for the municipal authority on the back end. The city of Agerstown can set their own rates. We're looking at that right here. Um, test your own rates in that system and have full transparency into all the data dashboarding in real time. And um, last but not least is our adoption model success. Jen hit on that. We'll talk a little bit more about our marketing team. But um, once anyone learns the value of a mobile payment transaction, they want to drive it home. And we have a team that can help support that. That includes Jen and I on the ground. And, and ultimately hearing you guys talk about a lot of the other city agendas, there's so much we cannot help with, unfortunately. But for paid parking, we can help it be as efficient as possible and as safe as possible. So I'll kick it back to Jen. All right, thanks, Adam. I think I might have frozen here. Okay, so jumping into the next slide and just ensuring everyone can still see the, the screen, right? So paranoid with the, the virtual yes, here. Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so um, we are the original mobile payments provider in the in the industry, having been founded over 20 years ago. Um, so we are now wholly owned by uh, Volkswagen, and so that's partly why our company has been able to remain such a strong force during the pandemic. Uh, in addition to the access of capital, we're able to transform the parking experience into a much bigger mobility picture. Um, so as exemplified in this image here, um, uh, this image shows the, the in-car dashboard, if you will. So uh, where pay by phone integration helps drivers navigate where they can go ahead and pay for parking. And then in, in addition to Volkswagen, we have extensive partnerships with Apple, Google, and Amazon. And so not only is the pay by phone app available on the Apple Watch, but parkers also have the ability to pay for parking using Siri or Amazon Alexa. Uh, so making this a true contactless and seamless endeavor. And then a quick snapshot of our highlights. But what I would like to specifically draw attention to is our 4.9 star rating and the 24-7, 365 call center. So should ever a question arise, we don't want our parkers to have to bog down your staff. A lot of companies in the world make it very cumbersome uh, to get a hold of a real person. And so um, we, you know, we want the, the pay by phone parking experience to be seamless and enjoyable. So therefore, in just three clicks, uh, Parker get, a parker can get hold of a real person available in several different languages. Um, and the feedback in the app truly does speak for itself with the 4.9 stars. Okay, so then jumping into the pay by phone experience. So here is a sample of what the parker would see when they go to pay for parking in Hagerstown. So the consumer would make contact with the signs uh, and the signs get designed with Hager, Hagerstown's approval and are fully supplied by pay by phone. And so this is a good opportunity to remind everyone, as we mentioned at the beginning of this, that this solution does not cost the city anything. 
Uh, so pay by phone does not charge anything up front for the use of the app and we do supply all of the signage. So the way that we make a profit, if you will, is, is the user would pay for parking per usual and then we charge a convenience fee. And so that the city can go ahead and, and push that convenience fee to the parker, which keeps, um, you know, the, the city the city is able to keep the entirety of the parking revenue and um, and then it, it becomes a virtually free system. So the parkers can choose to use the meters like they've always been, or they can enjoy the convenience of our app. And so included in such conveniences are the ability to pay for parking from the comfort and safety of, of the car, say it's raining outside and the kids are screaming in the back seat, uh, a parker can just simply launch the app and pay for a parking session right then and there. And so I did mention earlier, a real life example of what the city of Atlanta is currently using for their dynamic label, so that landing page. So on the right is an image of um, the dynamic label and they're using that to convey the flatten the curve COVID messaging. And so we're actually working with a lot of cities whether or not they're charging for parking right now um, to be able to utilize that. So it, it has access to quite a lot of parkers. And so, you know, instead of going to the meter and seeing what the parking situation is, they can just launch the app and be able to have that information at their fingertips. Uh, and so the video clip touched upon our guest login feature, which helps parkers execute the pay by phone process quite rapidly. Um, but to further contribute to a fast and frictionless process, if you will, parkers also have the ability to sign in via Apple. Um, so that takes them to their account in you know, roughly less than 10 seconds. And okay, so here's a sample of what the app experience looks like. So when I'm in person, I like to do a live demo, but with um, the remote situation, it's just a little bit trickier. So I, um, I do have screenshots here of the, um, of the process, if you will. So say I drive to you know, an hour to Hagerstown and park my car right outside of German pub that I've heard so much about. Um, I launched the pay by phone app and through geofencing, I can see the nearby location. Alternatively, I could look up at a sign that we provide and enter in the location number. And so you're able to do that, you know, either one. Um, so then I go to the next screen, as you can see this, um, the next one, which confirms where I'm parked, which car I'm parking, the duration of my stay, and the payment method that I would like to use. So another added benefit of um, our system is that you have a thumbnail picture, or you, you can add a thumbnail picture of the vehicle so you can easily identify which car you're parking with. So you can look and say, yep, that's my Mazda, quick glance, or, or, or no, that's uh, my, my rental car that I'm using, and just switch that really quickly. Um, and so another fun fact too, you can go ahead and, and um, oh, actually before I get into that, um, you can, um, after, after you go through and confirm the pay and park, you are prompted to the next screen after the payment is processed and that shows a countdown timer. And so then additionally, if you have a smartwatch, uh, you're able to see your time remaining from said watch and you also have the ability to extend your parking session from your phone, from your watch, et cetera, without the need to have to run back to the meter. And um, okay, so say once I've paid, I get a text message. And so that confirms my payment, as well as getting an email receipt uh, with the city of Hagerstown's logo on the receipt. So this is particularly useful if those that come into city hall and they're trying to uh, contest a parking fee should that ever arise. Um, and then, um, where else I was gonna go with this? Is, so one quick thing to note too is, uh, we were actually founded five years prior to the smartphone. So, uh, if you can believe it or not, we were, you know, paying, helping pay for, for parking before you could even use a smartphone. So, and how that works is you would dial in a number and you would be able to pay through a secure portal. So, say for those non-smartphone parkers in Hagerstown um, who are looking to pay for parking, they can just go ahead and dial in that number and pay for parking that way. Um, so, not only do you have the, the dial-in option, but you can also do, you know, contactless method with, with Amazon Alexa. Uh, theory, et cetera. And then let's see. So now going into one of my favorite things that we do is marketing and driving adoption. So simply put, we don't just plant a flag in the sand and walk away. Um, we truly work with our partners. And in the city of Miami, for example, over 94% of the parking revenue is, is uh, takes place through pay by phone. So on day one of go live, you'll find me here in the city with, um, you know, a pay by phone shirt and the street team passing out pay by phone flag and, 
encouraging partners to really use our app. And then here we have um, Adam, our, uh, our in-house street team, if you will. No, you can go right through and that, so it's fine. <laughs> great, great shot. All right, so to that note, we also go business to business and educate them um, you know, on this new method of paying for parking. So you know, we, we don't want customers to just come in and be like, what is the sign up front? So we, uh, we, we, that's part of our, our campaign and the local partnership, if you will. And so our team really enjoys getting creative with the various methods in order to, to drive that awareness. And that's exactly why we've been able to achieve such high adoption rates in the industry, such as, as I mentioned, the 94% in the city of Miami. And so Adam, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I, obviously I mentioned before, you guys can download the app yourself, um, Android, Apple, and actually see what Jen's gonna hit the play button and show you a little bit of a tour of what you would see and see these reviews, see images of what the app would actually look like um, from a smartwatch. Yeah, you can advance it, just advance the slide. But yeah, uh, again, there's over 250,000 reviews in the Apple Store with a 4.9 rating. So those voices certainly speak a lot louder than Jen and I here today. And um, and the 24/7, 365 Jen mentioned before, we run a live call center. So it is about showing up, working with your team, showing them how to do the back office, showing them how to work through. Um, the enforcement side and, and, and the data that we're sharing in real time and all the reporting, but um, we take the end user, the Parker, their experience quite seriously uh, with the most users globally and the highest rated app. It will give you a good indication if you look through that. So it doesn't look like that wants to play, but that's okay. We can wrap it up and, and make sure we have a moment to answer any burning questions that any um, of y'all may have. Hey, buddy. Yeah, a quick question. What is the um, what's the interface for the enforcement personnel? Do they uh, go around with a a laptop or an iPad, or or how does that work? Our personnel um, already use a handheld device uh, from Clancy, uh, Clancy Enforcement, and uh, Pay by Phone integrates with Clancy, so they won't have another device. They'll use the same device, okay. and they'll be able to check the license plate and see if uh, parking's been paid for or not. Okay, thank you. Yep. The other thing I wanted to add too was that no modifications to our parking meters. People don't have to use this app. This will be another option for them. The parking meters will remain just in case. Um, people will be able to pay their app um, just like they always have. This will just present another option uh, for people to pay. In this case, a touchless option. They won't be touching money. We won't be touching money. Um, they can pay off the phone and um, um, pay by phone collects all the fees. And at the end of the month, then they cut us a check and send us the revenue that we normally would um, off that meter. How, how many parking meters do we have? How many parking meters? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure the exact number, seven or 800. I forget the exact number. Okay. And, and they'll and all be parking lots, in parking lots and street. Okay. But we, but as, as they were saying there, Jason had downloaded the apps on each of these. Uh, one of the things that convinced us with Pay by Phone was he downloaded the apps, looked at the reviews. For uh, this app, very easy to download. Not very many running. Uh, reviews were, as they said, 4.9 out of 5, uh, mostly positive. Uh, the other thing is, is that, uh, as Jen mentioned, she's in Washington, D.C. Um, they have a rep that's close by. So if we have any issues or have any concerns, somebody physically can be here in a short amount of time. Most of the other applications, I think the other closest was probably Philadelphia, Philadelphia or possibly, I think Atlanta was the other one. So that was some things that convinced us to go with payment phone. The service fee that's extended to the end user, um, can you disclose how much that is in comparison to the other Pay by phone apps that you've looked at. Uh, the fee in the, in the memo, what they're charging is thirty three cents per transaction. That's comparable to the other ones. One of them was a percentage uh, fee, but there were some features about the program we didn't really care for. So I'll, I'll just say that I don't have the other fees in front of me. I can get that to you. 
Uh, I can tell you they're, they're all comparable. Okay. I just want to clarify that. Oops, sorry, Shelly. Uh, that 33 cents does include the merchant fee. So that is not a portion that's going entirely to pay by phone. So it's actually, you know, um, merchant fees, not to bore everyone, but it's a hybrid with a fixed rate and a variable rate. And for a $1 transaction, you're talking about 20 something cents in merchant fees. As you get above $1, the merchant fees, the variable piece just gets, gets higher and higher. So pay by phone is a flat 33 cent rate, no matter how much the parking transaction is. And then we cover all those merchant fees for the city. So the city of Hagerstown will keep 100% of all of their parking revenue and the users will just have this option to have a contactless, touchless, efficient experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this concept. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? If I'm sorry. Ahead. I'm sorry. One more question. How soon can this be implemented? Like, what is the time frame that we're looking at? Well, we'd have to bring Beautiful. the council at the end of the month of resolution and motion to accept this contract. So at the end of the month is when that could be accepted. And then Adam and Jen can talk about how much longer it would take after that to actually put it in place. It's the beautiful part about what we do is there is no hardware. There's there's no hardware to buy or install. There's no software to license. Everything is web based. So um, the city of Hagerstown has a sample of what our signage would look like. That's the extent of our implementation is getting approval from your team on the signage. That would be decals placed on each meter and um, 18 by 24 metal signs to be hung wherever you guys want, especially in, in lot locations, if there are off street lot locations. Um, our, our normal time from contract execution to go live is four to six weeks. The other, uh, I hate to mention this, but the other glitch in this is uh, we're not sure when paid parking is going to go back in the in the service. We don't know if we'll start charging parking tomorrow or two months from now. And I think that's day by day. But we can continue to move forward with pay by phone. We get the contract signed and start getting the to get the system in place so when pay parking goes back into operation it'll be good to go and we can also utilize that dynamic label as the city of atlanta is to be able to convey any kind of covid messaging too so perhaps if the if the parking is still you know free etc for for a bit more time that that message can still be relayed with the app even though um, no one's paying for parking Okay, anybody else? Because it sounds like a uh, great opportunity for us. And again, it can be implemented and it can seamlessly, uh, in, you know, people can use it as soon as we start charging for parking. So, uh, all right, we'll start moving forward then with uh, pay by phone. Uh, starting, there's some stuff that we have to provide them some information. Uh, officially, the mayor and council won't approve this till the end of the month, but we'll go ahead and start working with them and keeping this moving forward for everybody. Sounds good. I think the citizens would uh, like an alternative to, to there now. So, yeah, I would like to see this uh, in place as soon as those bags come off of the meters. Personally, agreed. Make Tomorrow, you take them off. All when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> Just ride by on your bike and rip it right off. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Okay, next up is the uh, Sailor House uh, uh, request for landmark overlay status. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, the Sailor House, as you know, is in Kiwanis Park, and we've been working with the Washington County Historic Trust to uh, allow them to make some improvements to the house. They want to restore the exterior, uh, build a new front porch on it, uh, and do some other things to the structure that we've talked about before. In 2018, uh, the FEMA redid the floodplain maps, and it turns out that the new maps were drawn, and the house is now in the 100 year floodplain of Antietam Creek. Um, we were a little surprised by that, even a little skeptical by it, but it is just barely within the floodplain. 
So therefore the planning staff is telling us that um, you cannot make major renovations to a building like the historic trust wants to do if the structure is in a floodplain, unless the structure is deemed historic. Um, so the suggestion then would be for the city to put our own landmark designation on this structure so that the trust can go ahead and do the work that they wanna do. Uh, I've attached to you in your packet, a lot of information on the house. I think the history is definitely there. The questions really are whether or not we wanna put this landmark status on it. So my request tonight is if you're okay with it, we'd like permission to start the process and the letter that's in your packet, Scott and I would send to Kathy and they would start the process that would ultimately come back to you to approve. I assume that if we can put this status on a property, we can also take it away, but uh, if we'd ever wanna do that in the future. But uh, this would um, allow them to proceed, the historic trust to proceed, getting uh, funding and do the improvements to the house that they wanted to do. I'm good with it. Shelly, yeah. All right. Yep. I, okay. I just have a quick question. Of course you do. Thanks. Um, so for this, adding that designation, this isn't going to 20 years down the road put us in a fairgrounds housekeeper situation where we're stuck with a building and needs a ton of money. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, it is not the same. Uh, what happened there was to, we accepted money from the historic trust and they have an easement on it. This would right. be a landmark status that we ourselves would put on, on the structure. Kathy, do you want to add anything to that? Which I we think can the, only, the only wrinkle would be is if the money that the Washington County Historical Trust gets to work on this project comes with the string of having to have an easement. Right. And we'd have to be careful with that as we go through and they get their money that we don't allow that to happen. Or if we do, we, we do it knowingly. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, fiscal year 21 budget review, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me still? As we keep changing people, yep. it's, hard, yeah, yeah. it's hard to make sure that everything's still in good working order. Sounds good. So um, before I start on the fiscal year 21 budget and some of the charts that I specifically sent around, I just wanted to touch base. Scott has previously mentioned, um, he mentioned it last week and he did a little, a little blurb earlier today. We did at the city of Hagerstown send out notifications to customers who had outstanding utility bills, electric, water, wastewater, if the bills had been outstanding prior to March the 1st. So those notifications had gone out. We did that um, in an effort to be proactive, to continue and have open lines of communication, and just to help remind people of where their balances were because once the executive order is lifted June the 1st, we didn't want the first communication from the city to be terminations and cutoffs are in place effective immediately. We wanted to give people the opportunity and to remind them that even though City Hall, the building is closed to the public right now, city staff is still here working, answering phones, taking, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have a Dropbox and they are also able to do anything via online. Dry in this office tonight, I'm very sorry. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the fiscal year 21 budget. Again, we've been focusing for the most part the last several weeks on revenue and with the uncertainty of revenue, um, it makes the expense out of the equation just as uncertain meaning there were lots of things that we included and were hopeful um, to implement and incorporate at the time that we submitted the initial budget, 
but with our revenue side, half of that scale being unknown, the impact and if it's not a continuous impact, the delay in the cash flow and the revenue um, just means that to continue to be fiscally prudent, the city administrator, myself, city department heads, along with mayor and council, would need to go ahead and adopt this budget and understand that July 1, operationally, it does not mean business as usual with the city of Hagerstown. Um, there are many areas of expenses, just like on the revenue side, that are fixed in nature, meaning utility costs. Because the city of Hagerstown is open, we at the general fund pay utility costs. We actually pay for a lot of other things as well. Um, and those types of utilities, we will continue to have those fees no matter what we do because we are open for business. Um, there are things that we have like loans and bonds specifically that are outstanding that no matter what happens in our revenue stream, we've already made those commitments and have those obligations in place that we need to make those payments. So no matter if we don't receive our revenue over the next couple months in the manner in which we are in the manner of which we're accustomed, we still have commitments and bond ratings and um, obligations that we must meet that we cannot defer. So when we take a step back and look at the expenses in which we can control, delay, defer, there's a small window, a small sampling of what those categories are. Um, but when I sent out and included in a, a packet that when it, um, went out this evening, I included several schedules um, one that I just wanted to take a minute to talk about was, again, the use of general fund balance reserves in the fiscal year 21 budget. Originally, we had included that we were going to utilize $2.4 million in fiscal year 21. Part of that money um, actually is already tied up in existing obligations, but $1.4 million is not. At the time we did the budget, we had about 1.4 million left over from fiscal year 19 as a surplus that we were willing to utilize towards infrastructure. Um, that 1.4 million was going to be used for things like fire department engine reserve, police vehicle, improvements here at City Hall, sidewalk replacement program throughout the city, um, the city's local match of professional court extension, which was a topic that I think Rodney discussed and had approved just recently, and along with some public safety radios. And I'm not saying at this point, because everything is unknown, that we would definitely not be utilizing that, but we need to wait until we know how the year is going to look for fiscal year 20, because if we have to use, say we have this, this, this money, 1.4 million, if in fiscal year 20, we have to use some of that, that means it's not available to use again in fiscal year 21. So one of the things that I've asked departments to take a step back and just really be cognizant of all the capital and projects that they are doing and what the funding sources were. So depending on the funding sources move forward, depending on the priority of the project definitely move forward. But otherwise, if it was something that was gonna be fund balance reserve, and it's an item that is not high priority that we need to wait and not present um, in June and July and try to move purchases forward. One of the next things that I included, um, and I did include in this packet several things that were included in the budget book. One is the general fund expenditures by type, and it's a chart that um, reflects three different years of expenses, and that is actually in the budget book, section one, page 37. And for the proposed budget fiscal year 21, um, general fund total expenses were $51.1 million. The majority, or 64% of that, which was approximately $32.5 million, was for salaries and benefits. And again, that was 64%, so 32.5% and 51 million. Um, and I know that there's at least one council member who points this out. That percentage is 
fairly consistent. Again, it's our largest um, expenditure across the board and has been for years and pretty much lines up with um, our largest revenue source, which is our total property tax. Some of the other expenditures. So when we look through the categories, we've got salaries and wages, we have some contracted services, we have things like insurance. So where I was mentioning earlier, there's some things that we know that we can look and try to defer and wait to see what happens, but there's things that we can't. One of those things we, we know we have an obligation and we'll have to pay is insurance. Um, debt service we have to pay. So for those things that aren't quite fixed, um, we will be working over the next couple of weeks and months to identify as soon as reasonably possible, the total impact on the revenue side, but we're gonna to have to do that same thing on the expense side. Hand in hand with um, general fund, I think when we talk about large components and major portions, Again, if we're talking about categories and not looking and discussing individual departments, that absolutely is on our employee side for benefits, overtime, and um, wages. But if we decide to just take a step back and look at this general fund dollars and we say we got 51 million across the board, where is our largest dollar spent in the way of um, department or program area? And the largest portion is spent in public safety. So I included a chart on public, uh, public safety schedule just for reference so that everybody could see at the time that we initially put together the budget document, um, what the fiscal year 20 uh, projections were as well as the proposed fiscal year 21 budget. And for public safety, public safety is defined um, as the police department, fire department, code administration, as well as signal department. From an expense standpoint, 51% or 26.2 million is of the general funds, 51 million in expenses is on public safety. To kind of relay that back, the same category, that same, those same areas, which is public safety, um, contributes 9% of the total revenue base or about 4.7 million of the 51 million in the fiscal year 20 budget. The next big category and item I just want to reference is that for the same departments in, of public safety on the capital side, in addition to the 26.2 million of operating expenses, the budget also included 7.6 million in capital and infrastructure projects. So a couple, couple key, and I, and I know people hate statistics and these numbers can mean a million things, but so if we take a step back just to refresh, on the operating expense side, public safety encompasses 51% of the total expenses, which was 26 million. It, reflects 9% or 4.7 million of the revenue in the general fund. And then we, we talk about that and we said, you know, we've already acknowledged that the large component of expenses in, in salaries and wages. So for public safety, there's about 228 total full-time positions out of the general funds total 317. That is just shy of 72% of all full-time staffing in the general fund comes from public safety. Again, this chart is just as referenced so that we can see some of the largest areas and where our money and dollars were in the fiscal year 21 budget. And then last but not least, I also included one final item because as we talk about the pandemic and the COVID and the items and the impact that we are seeing right now, you know, unlike prior years where all of the focus at the city and the budget has been about the general fund, we have to acknowledge as a city, it's a citywide impact, it impacts all funds. So one of the, the items that I included this afternoon was also a schedule of amenities. And this chart is included in the budget document and it is in section one on page 10. 
And again, it's citywide and it includes fiscal year 20 projections as well as fiscal year 21 proposed budget. And in the general fund, um, amenities are things like the farmer's market, the pool, Hager House, train museum, municipal stadium, um, all the various events that occur, the ice rink and all other parks and recreational events. And when we look at fiscal year 21, we had operating expenses estimated of about 3.1 million with revenue contributions to offset of about 374,000, which means um, when we looked at a few other factors as well as the capital expenses and infrastructure requirements at those amenities and locations, about $4.9 million is gonna be needed need to be subsidized. And when we say subsidized, um, that could be forced from the taxes or also from future bond issues. In addition to the general fund, there's amenities like the golf course and it um, was short about 326,000, meaning their direct operating expenses were higher than the direct revenue. So we included a stipend from the general fund to help cover that shortage. The parking fund, um, direct revenue there is a million dollars, direct operating expenses of 900,000, um, which is great news. And it sounds like, you know, they would be in the red. The only um, factor that's a little bit different in fiscal year 21 was that we included some costs, initial costs for an additional parking deck. So those capital expenses um, would, would cause a need to possibly look at a future bond issue to help subsidize that fund. Last but not least is property management. And property management, um, we own several buildings and we have things like an art gallery um, at 3640 North Potomac Street. And we also have a bureau box. And so those things cost more money than what we're receiving in income as well and are considered an overall amenity. This schedule is not, again, reflective of any one thing, just more an area of um, not necessarily core services that the city provides, but of areas across the city where we have expenses as well as uh, amounts of revenue to offset, but not quite to the level of um, what the costs are. One of the last things I just want to say is that is all of this unfolds and happens. One of the biggest costs and expenses that is likely to occur and happen and um, will not see that in fiscal year 21, probably will not see that until fiscal year 22 is simply this. The markets are not doing and performing financially well. So when that happens, um, things like the state of Maryland pension fund, as well as your own police and fire uh, pension plans will possibly at the end of June not perform as well as expected or have major losses. If that were to occur, it is possible and highly likely that in fiscal year 22, our funding needs would be much higher or a higher percentage than what we were providing in fiscal year 21 to help try to strengthen and get funded percentages back where they need it to be. Again, I know that this is not a very detailed, normal, typical budget conversation, more a high level. Um, again, just to kind of discuss the different types of things and where we're spending money. Um, just so that we're aware as we continue conversations and as things start to return to normal, um, where we need to start focusing some of our attention. Is there any questions for me at this time? Michelle, I had a quick question. Um, so just just so I make sure I understand the the uh, three the eight hundred sixty five thousand dollars in the parking fund under capital expenses. That's if we do a third deck in FY twenty one. The 865,000, actually it's several different things. And if we were to um, look specifically in the capital project section, you'll see there are some other planned projects, smaller projects, some things in the lots, um, some renovations, 
that we knew we were going to need as well in the parking deck and then a portion of the beginning acquisition um, for parking deck. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the mind that uh, this go around, we're going to be uh, looking, have, have to look very closely at some of these things because the uh, 3.8 million in parks, 865,000 parking fund and 100,000 borough box, um, and then 150,000 of the farmer's market. I assume that 150,000 is for the retrofit for the fire department. Actually, no. So when the amenity schedule underneath the farmer's market, we had direct revenue in of 9,700 and that, that revenue is actually from other city departments in, internally um, for parking that is available over underneath the market house. We have direct operating expense of 78,000 and I think the operating expenses again are those things that we do um, they include utilities, supplies, things that we have to have to operate the farmer's market one day a week. But the 150000 that was reflected under capital expenses, and I don't, you caught me off guard, Austin, I'll admit, I don't have my budget book in front of me, but it was not the retrofit uh, for the fire department administrative building in its entirety. This 150 was to cover um, a roof that's in dire need of replacement. Mm. Okay. And there may have been one other small little item in that hundred and fifty, but I can check and send you an email this in the morning. And then the uh, the we're going from uh, capital expenses for parks. We're going from uh, one point four million to three point really nine million. And I know is Pangborn in that the the retrofit to the pond. Yes. So. Uh, 3.9 million in capital expenses related to all other parks. Yes, Penborn is in there, but also a good portion of that is going to be reflected for you know the UIP Plaza as well as the finishing and the completion of the A and E Trail. Okay. You know, this was going to be a transformative budget anyway, um, mm -hmm. when when it was originally created, uh, recognizing the the uh, flatness of the assessments uh, during the triennial. Um, so I think Michelle and I both feel that probably this budget is the best case scenario that we could look. Um, yeah. that we could look at um, what we're going to need to do. Um, in the next several weeks is begin to hone in on the what ifs of um, revenues are 10% lower, 20% lower, 30% lower, and how that is going to affect what we need to adjust within the budget expense wise. Not going to be a whole lot we can do revenue wise uh, because of the way revenues are structured for municipalities in Maryland what we're going to have to do expense wise. Um, so as, as much as this was going to be a budget that, that required some changing of operations, that was a best, that was a best case scenario. Um, so we, we're going to have, we're going to have our work cut out for us. We're, we're fortunate in that our main source of revenue is fairly um, inelastic as far as, as revenue, property revenues go. Um, Oh, we have a concern as far as what may happen uh, through the, the overall appeals process as moving forward, that we're going to have some talks with um, some of our state officials on that process. Uh, but it's the first year of our three-year triennial. So those assessed values are set for the most part. And we can only hope that the economy allows the revenues to continue to come in once we start to reopen uh, for business in the state, and we can not take as big a cut. Michelle can tell you, um, as far as the first real uh, month of, of a revenue effects of closing down, uh, the comparison between March of 2019 to March of 2020, uh, Michelle was about a 1.8 million deficit in receipts across all across the enterprise. So actually, the month of March wasn't 
March 2019 compared to March 2020 was not too terribly bad, but the entire month of April, so April 2019 compared to April 2020, um, we took a step back and looked at deposits. And when we looked at deposits, basically in looking at deposits payments for things like the tax bills, payments for things like the utility bills, um, and again, knowing that we didn't move forward with the tax sale process um, effective May the 1st, and it was delayed, and knowing that cutoffs didn't happen April 1, but yeah, excuse me, yes, it was down about 1.6 million in deposits from last year in April to current year in April. The number of calls um, coming into City Hall specifically to support services definitely increased on Friday. Um, way more than what we have seen on average. But again, the amount of transactions and what we are posting is significantly lower than in prior years. We are not, we are very fortunate at the city of Hagerstown. It's one of those things, you know, everybody has always said before, I think we've heard it before, let's use the rainy day fund to give raises, let's use the rainy day fund to do this, let's use the cash surpluses to do a multitude of things. And we've always been, very financially and fiscally prudent. And we've said, you know, no, we're not using fund balance reserve for normal recurring expenses. And this is exactly why we don't. So that while others are struggling, many other, not just on the private side, but many other governmental agencies have furloughed, have laid off, have cut staff in half, have implemented hiring freezes, have implemented hiring or salary freezes. And they did all of that a month and a half ago and three weeks ago. Um, we're very fortunate for those of us that work at the city of Hagerstown that that has not been us at this point in time. And um, just to piggyback with what Scott was mentioning about the taxes, yes, taxes are elastic. It's one of those things, you know, we all hope that we wouldn't see such a huge impact. We, I will mention that we, did hear that there was a collective group, um, basically that represents the commercial side that asked the state Department of Assessment and Taxation to basically do a, an entire new um, evaluation or assessment <laughs> before the July 1 bills rolled out statewide. And uh, the stance I believe with the state Department of Assessment and Taxation is that, you know, unfortunately, all the assessments were done in final as of January 1 of 2020 for the tax bills that are going into place for July 1, 2020. But again, as Scott mentioned, we're very cognizant and, um, you know, things, appeals happen through a local PTAB board, and we're not sure what may happen from that point. All right, anybody else uh, on Michelle's uh, presentation? First, I want you know I'm I'm, I'm going to chime in here real fast. Um, I have the utmost confidence in our finance people and our city administrator to ensure that we're doing everything on our end that we can uh, to uh, retain as much. Uh, of our rainy day fund, as it is called, uh, during this crisis, because we know that, uh, you know, uh, I, unless someone has heard something I haven't, I see absolutely nothing changing in the, you know, in the very near future. Uh, at least our governor is not moving that way. So we have to, uh, you know, do what we need to do to maintain all the services that we give our people or that they pay for, uh, and, uh, and do it in a uh, responsible manner. And again, my hat's off to our finance department and our city administrator. Uh, this is gonna be a tough uh, budget year. It's gonna be very fluid. It's, it's not cut and dry like it usually is. Uh, so uh, we just have to keep an eye on everything. And I, I have the utmost faith in, faith in Michelle that, she, that she'll do that for us. Thank you. All right, moving on, proposed guidelines for state-funded life safety infrastructure grant program. 
Welcome, Jonathan Cohn. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Have some new program guidelines that we're looking to uh, adopt uh, this month. We received award of a $125,000, uh, excuse me, State of Maryland Strategic Demolition Grant for an initiative that would, or a grant program that would assist with development projects in our downtown, uh, specifically related to some of the utility infrastructure costs that come about with the redevelopment projects in our downtown uh, that require fire suppression, say, uh, fire suppression systems or better uh, known as sprinkler systems. Uh, we have seen this uh, issue arise over, uh, over the years. We have numerous projects that have, uh, that have occurred in the downtown that have consisted of mixed use or, or commercial uh, redevelopment. And if the, the code requirements require a fire suppression system to be either installed or upgraded at that property, uh, there are a lot of times that the utility uh, and, and infrastructure uh, is required to also be upgraded at that time as well. So it's just another development hurdle that, that can be run into from a cost perspective for, for developers and, and, uh, uh, and building owners downtown. Cost can be can be very significant because this usually involves uh, cutting into the street, uh, working with our utilities department to uh, add a new uh, water line, uh, add a new water service line to the building. Uh, would require excavation of the street sidewalk, adding a meter vault in the sidewalk area, the public right of way areas, uh, and then the uh, utilities department also works on on tapping that new line, putting in the meter, and sometimes depending on uh, public right-of-way size, depending on maybe the, the difficulty of the excavation, depending on where the water line is, uh, the water main line is in the street. Some of these costs, uh, I believe, have, have at times run upwards of 50, 60, and even $70,000. And that is, a, I think, a big hit sometimes to uh, the developer's pockets uh, and, again, can be uh, a barrier to, to some, some of our development projects in downtown. So, the, the purpose of this grant and, and the request of the state was again to help defray the costs related to all of that infrastructure work. So we're looking for mayor and council's feedback on the proposed guidelines. We would like to get these guidelines adopted this month. Uh, I think we, uh, the good news in all this is we are still uh, seeing uh, development activity and we're, we're getting inquiries at DCED about development in downtown. And uh, this, this program would again would be another incentive for developers we, of course, have our existing Invest Hagerstown grant programs that, that can, can provide significant grants, to, uh, significant grants to downtown development projects. This is just yet another uh, incentive uh, that can help defray costs, uh, especially costs like the infrastructure costs related to these utility upgrades. Sometimes uh, there may be some uh, unknowns that, that come into play after the fact, and uh, it would be, uh, again, a, a a great incentive for us as a city to offer through the state program funding to, to be able to say, uh, here's here's a $25,000 grant to help offset that fifty or $60,000 uh, utility uh, upgrade costs that you're receiving. Um, so the highlights of the grant, uh, uh, I'll try to go over that quickly. Um, again, it's, it's meant to target downtown redevelopment projects in the city center uh, mixed use zoning area. Uh, it would have to be commercial or a mixed use project that's based upon the state programming guidelines uh, for the grant. We would also be looking uh, at, at projects again, it would require the significant utility uh, infrastructure upgrade. It's not a fire suppression or sprinkler system incentive. Uh, it's not for, for funding the fire suppression systems on the inside of the building. It's again meant to defray the significant costs that come with the, uh, the utility work that is on the outside of the building. Uh, and the grants would be a range of fifteen dollars to $25,000. And in general, uh, uh, many of the projects are, are not going to have a problem with the proposed match of, of, of 50 or excuse me, a one-to-one -one match. So it's basically a 50-50 split between the grant and the developer's contribution. Uh, and, and we worked uh, closely with Nancy on uh, so the guidelines and the typical process for this. Uh, I'll also say uh, discussions with our fire department, Chief Lore and uh, Fire Marshal Doug DeHaven. I know they're excited about this grant. Um, we feel that the match is something that's easily achieved by developers in these cases because, again, the costs are, are, are usually 
well above the, the, the $25,000 range. Uh, and, and then also we can consider some of the interior costs uh, as at least part of the match as well. Uh, and again, it would be administered by our, uh, our, our DCED review committee, similar to our other Investigatorstown grants application process of, of the developer submitting uh, the request uh, uh, to DCED. A review committee would be uh, uh, reviewing those applications, and then we would go from there with with approval and, and grant uh, uh, grant uh, check to the developer once the uh, infrastructure work is completed. So I'm good with questions? this. <laughs> that uh, the art grant is a uh, this is a one time. Uh, one time thing that we've got this year. Is there any chance that would be available in future years too? Uh, through the state funding, I mean, we have had success with uh, repeated grants. Uh, there's no guarantee, but uh, an example would be uh, the state community legacy grants. We've received uh, repeated grants for student housing projects. So if this is successful, uh, I'm, I'm depending again on state budget, uh, how, how that uh, plays out in future years. It's something we um, could look at through the state. And we can continue to apply, uh, apply each year to ARC as well to see if it's something we can uh, continue uh, through other sources of funding. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think it's definitely possible to, to keep on the radar for future years. Uh, and yeah, I think it's, resources. It, it's a great, I think it's a great program for, for development because I, I can imagine uh, after all the cost projections and everything else to do a, a building renovation to find out that you've now got to fund a, uh, a, a major uh, hydraulic uh, structure out in the middle of the street and all the street closures and sidewalk removal and re rebuilding. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite a hit. So I think this is great. Anybody else? Anything for Jonathan? Okay. So moving on, Jonathan, you're still there. The food is Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I believe uh, dessert. <laughs> I believe uh, Leslie Hart is joining us as well uh, on uh, phone call through uh, the meeting portal here, and I think she is on. Uh, Leslie, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Great. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, Leslie is the business uh, business specialist for agriculture tourism and hospitality for Washington County. And uh, she has been leading a series of meetings with some community partners and DCED staff uh, has been part of, of these meetings. Uh, and it's a discussion of a food desert initiative to, to possibly look at a, a goodwill operated small grocery store in the downtown area. And part of the initiative again looks, or it goes to uh, looking at our, our downtown and other areas of the community that would likely be considered food deserts. And in the uh, memo, I put some information about uh, how the USDA describes food deserts. I don't think there's a, there's necessarily a, a black and white definition of that, but in general, they look at the, the population density of an area, they look at uh, the, the income of the population, and then they would also look at how far away is the nearest grocery store. And it especially is, is concerning when you have the low to moderate income population areas uh, that, that may have transportation issues, are they able to walk uh, less than a mile to the nearest grocery store? So when looking at some of our downtown community uh, uh, sections uh, of Hagerstown and even some areas of the West End, there's definitely not a grocery store that's walkable. Uh, and, and, and again, they're not looking at small convenience type stores. They're trying to look at that uh, grocery stores such as Lidl or Aldi or Martins or, or Wise, those would be uh, considered uh, grocery stores or even uh, Walmarts. So uh, with that uh, concern in mind of, of, of food desert areas in Hagerstown, uh, I believe Leslie can, can take over and maybe start to talk about how the partners uh, came together and looking at this initiative to, to see if there's a possibility of, of seeking USDA grant funding uh, to assist with the initiative. And again, that would involve uh, numerous community partners uh, Goodwill, uh, Washington County Government, Community Action Council, Commission on Aging, Washington County uh, Food Council, Meritus Health is involved as well, and VFF Produce uh, and their mobile farmers market. 
Uh, and so Leslie, if you want to take over and maybe give a, an overview of how this uh, has come about and, and also uh, the USDA grant process and how that's being handled and our request and the request for a city of Hagerstown letter of support or letter of partnership. Yes, thank you. Um, I just also want to let you know that uh, Susan Small, director for Washington County Department of Business Development, is also on the phone with us as well. Uh, thank you, Susan, for being here. Um, what, I'm what I'm requesting from the city council is simply a letter of support. I'm not asking for any financial um, contribution, just the letter to support this initiative. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time over the last few months. And then a USDA grant opportunity for $500,000 crossed my desk. And I was able to make connections with multiple partners where we're basically creating um, opportunities for agriculture, for the low income population, for youth, for seniors, for education, um, that we can tie all this together and also create a healthy community. Um, so the first piece of this, um, we do require a 25% match to the $500,000. Emeritus has willingly uh, donated to us several acres of land adjacent to the Emeritus Robin Wood location, where we will be planting um, a, a, a vegetable garden and a fruit garden. It's going to be called a community garden, and it will have multiple revenue streams. Um, the first one uh, will go directly into Meritus to serve the patients that live there. It'll be things like herbs, potatoes, vegetables, maybe some strawberries, um, some small fruit, um, those kinds of things. The second revenue stream for that program will be to um, the community in general. They will be selling vegetables at a retail uh, price, which hopefully will create a sustainability model for that garden. The next piece to that is there is a food pharmacy program that Meritus is very passionate about that a doctor will see a patient and he will identify that patient to be obese, high blood pressure, um, diabetic, and he will write a prescription for fruits and vegetables for free. That patient will take that written prescription and will go to this community garden located at Meredith and will be able to get local fruits and vegetables. We will have to backfill with that a little bit from other uh, vegetable and fruit producers in our community. Um, and that will also create a sustainable model. Um, there will be some, some cost implications there, but we're gonna try to keep it as small as possible. Another revenue stream for that particular market, and this is where Hagerstown comes into play and our, our downtown community specifically, is uh, we would like to create a nonprofit grocery store in the downtown Hagerstown area designed exclusively, or it, it will include other people as well, but designed for the people that live in the Hagerstown community that have limited transportation and must walk to a grocery store. This uh, nonprofit grocery store will not carry a large amount of choices of product, but will have a heavy local component of fruits and vegetables, in addition to canned goods and things like that. Um, that operation will be also create another revenue stream. So when I list the partners <clears throat> that were, are involved in this entire thing, oh, and then um, I have a mobile farmer's market which is already up and operational. Um, they are located in the Boonesboro area and they already serve multiple locations in the downtown Hagerstown area where they, they provide um, more inexpensive food, reduced cost food to people that have uh, strained budgets and are low income. Uh, so all the players and parts and pieces with this entire grant include Community Action Council, uh, they're going to be a food distribution location. They're going to help us move food. Uh, Goodwill Horizon, they're going to be the ones leading the charge for the grocery store. And they've already started to identify a location um, on Jonathan Street. Um, and we hope to move forward with that and to possibly backfill with the grant to help them financially down the road. There will also be an education element 
tied to that grocery store on what you do with an eggplant or how you cook uh, peppers or other items to give them recipes. That will be University of Maryland Extension that will do education elements as well as training on how to use and cook with food, local food. Um, the, West, the Washington County Food Council will be there. Their mission is to uh, create more opportunities for people to have local products, make it more accessible and easier for them to get. Uh, Washington County government will be doing the same thing that I'm asking of the city is simply a letter of support. Um, who am I missing? Uh, Jonathan, I think I got everybody. Oh, and, and uh, the uh, Noble Farmers Market, Ed and Janet Kilpatrick, um, they, um, veterans for farmers, um, they will be uh, part of the logistics team that will help move food on a small scale around the community. So I think I have everybody. Oh, oh Commission on Aging, I forgot them. Commission on Aging as well is gonna be part of this and we're gonna use their locations throughout the county to drop additional fruits and vegetables. Leslie, I think that that really sounds great. I mean, we definitely have a, a food desert problem downtown. I was just curious with the um, the, um, the the choice of location. You mentioned Goodwill was looking at a location uh, down on Jonathan Street. Um, ha has anybody considered the uh, the farmers market building? I mean, we just heard the budget presentation where we've got a two hundred and uh, two hundred nineteen thousand dollars shortfall there in a, a building that uh, we uh, we desperately need to try to figure out how to use better and that's uh, that's right in that area um yes we can I can certainly um, pass that information along um, to um, Goodwill Horizon that is looking at that part and piece right now um, they are hoping at this point to get the building donated which will help financially to get that grocery store up and running quickly, um, but I think that's certainly open for discussion. Right now, all I'm looking for is, you know, we can, once we have the grant of $500,000, we will have some flexibility if we determine that there's a better location or that we want to shift and use the money, not maybe at this location, but somewhere else. Um, we may create additional revenue streams um, that also could go into this entire grant. Right now, a letter of support is all I'm seeking from you. I'm definitely good with that. I'm also good with the letter. Um, this is Shelly, Leslie. Um, and Austin, I do know that Goodwill and CAC, they, they were talking a, a bit about the farmer's market. So I think that that was something on their radar. So definitely a good. possibility. I think this is a great idea. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Sounds like you've got the uh, support of the council and uh, we'll, we'll put a letter to that effect uh, when you need it, Leslie. Yippee! Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank uh, you, Leslie. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, guys. And we'll be back then with a uh, letter of support. I believe we'll have that on the May 19th special session. Uh, for good because I believe the grant is due uh, the week after that. And uh, just to note uh, on Council Member Heffernan's comment, comments, we have had some general discussion with uh, Goodwill Horizon and some of the other partners. There was some discussion about synergies with the, the farmer's market and or the farmer's market space. So as Leslie mentioned, we can continue to discuss uh, those uh, options moving forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Kitty. Good evening, all. I hope all are well, and I hope you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Everything's good. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm here to give you some information about a request we had from the Abundant Life Tabernacle and uh, the pastor, um, Pastor Ralph Adams there. Uh, he requested, um, due to the governor's order prohibiting gatherings of more than 10 people, he requested to do a drive-in church service uh, in the central parking lot, um, which is permitted by the interpretive um, guidance that was issued from the governor's office. 
Um, so he would want to start um, the Sunday after next, I think it's the 17th um, of May. The service would just be an hour from 12 to 1 p.m. And he's requesting that 20 parking spaces be um, marked off for no parking during that time, which uh, Eric from Public Works said he could do. Um, we prepared a user agreement um, that sort of outlines the arrangement. Um, it can be terminated at any time um, by either party or when the governor's order is either changed or lifted. And uh, we also would like to request an exemption to the noise ordinance because there's a possibility that he may exceed the noise um, uh, decibel level that's allowed. Um, he doesn't really know. So he, we thought we should just put in for the, the exemption and I think we'll know more after the first Sunday, how it goes. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Anybody have anything? I, I have I have no objection to it at all, um, but I, I just do have a question um, about duty of fairness. If uh, if we do this for this organization, do we need to provide similar amenities for all the other religious organizations that are uh, right now restricted from from uh, getting together? Um, I, I don't know if uh, our our legal counsel has looked at that at all? Well, a legal counsel did look at the um, user agreement. They actually prepared it for us, so they, they know what's going on. Um, that conversation did come up, and um, I think one thing that came up, and Jill, you want to weigh in on this, is that most churches have parking lots, and this church doesn't have its own parking lot. Right. So we weren't really sure if there would be another request for that, and that it would be, this is only... Um, during this time period when people cannot gather. And so once the governor's order is lifted or changed, this, this agreement is terminated. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure it would even qualify for other churches to ever need that. Never need it. Okay, yeah, that, that, was, that was my only question, um, but I, I have no objections to it. Great. Anybody else have anything for okay. this? Has has anyone asked the city attorney about this? I just recall a conversation regarding the city accepting a religious donation a couple of years ago and the slippery slope that it was um, intermixing the two. So I'm just curious if this would fall in that same category. I don't know if you guys remember uh, what I'm talking ask about. The city attorney Yeah. Um, the uh, Kitty's correct. The city attorney reviewed the agreement. So I think it's more of a, a user agreement for the land. Although I hear what you're saying, we can clarify uh, with the city attorney if that particular uh, question that you have, um, Emily. I, I also think it, it is unique to this particular church because they do meet in the Academy Theater building. So the likelihood that we would have other requests from church groups wanting to use the central parking lot, I think would be differentiated because this is uh, a church adjacent to the central lot. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Kitty. Sounds good. Yep, I'm next up also. Uh, yes, you are. Um, and I think uh, I am. And I think Mimi, Mimi, are you here? I see her box on the screen. So I will get started. And maybe if you want to join in by unmuting, um, you can do that. Um, so the next request has to do with the Barbara Ingram School for the Arts Foundation uh, requesting uh, permission to decorate the lamppost similar to how they decorate them at the Christmas holiday time. Um, this would be, again, um, because students are not getting a regular graduation this year. This is to honor the graduating seniors from the BISFA um, class of 2020. So it would be the city center lampposts, um, about 80 students, so 80 different decorations. Um, they're 15 inches by 15 inches. A sample is enclosed in the packet. And uh, if approved by you next week, they would be installed um, beginning May 13th and they'd be taken down by June 16th or starting June 16th. Um, they are not requesting any funds. They have volunteers or they will hire a contractor who will do the work and um, follow city guidelines for installation and deinstallation. 
I love this idea. Yeah, I, I support it. Nice I, I think it's great. It, uh, can't can't do enough. I mean, I, I would hate to be graduating this year, but uh, this this will be nice, something nice we can do. Yeah, I agree. You've got thumbs great. up. And Shelly's all over. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. I saw it, Shelly. Thank you. Shailen. Okay, next, Invest Hagerstown and Center Program Report. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and is safe and healthy. Um, joining me today will be Jill to help answer any questions you may come up with after this report. Today, we're basically giving a quick status update on the Invest Hagerstown program through our department, the DCED. Uh, last year, in fiscal year 19, Mayor and City Council approved $800,000 to go towards our Invest Hagerstown program. Within that program, we have five initiatives, that being City Center Redevelopment Grant Program, Citywide Redevelopment Grant Program, Home Ownership Grant Program, Rental Property Re Rehabilitation, and Facade Grant Program. Attached to this memo, you will see all of the status reports that we have charted for you, but as a quick um, way to go over that, you can see that we had that $800,000 in funding from you, and 597,000 of that has already been committed to projects. Um, we have 53 estimated new jobs so far, and you will see that we have $32 million in new investment, which is spectacular. But even looking back to last year, we had 5.2 million. We've made a jump to 32 million. So that's something very amazing to note. Um, in addition to that update in the charts attached, staff is requesting that flexibility be given to our review committee who goes through all of the applications that are come in for those five initiatives in order to use the balance of our FY20 budget, which is 203,000, and a balance left in the FY19 budget that was forfeited by an unfinished project, which is 25,000. We are hoping to total those together for $228,000 $228, to go across any of our five programs. That could be any of those five. Um, there are some other initiatives that the department has been talking about. Um, an example would be, do we put a large sum of this towards a potential private sector purchase towards 170 West Washington Street? As we know, we have been in ownership of that for a while. We've had some difficulties getting that to move because of the investment that will be needed to go into that. We've had a lot of people look. I think our business development specialist, Doug, has probably been out there 12 times so far and we just started in October. Um, so that is an option, but we are here to hear any of your thoughts um, and ideas for that. And I'll just um, supplement what Caitlin said. Uh, each year we come to you toward the end of the fiscal year uh, and look for that flexibility. Um, you can tell in a couple of the programs, our home ownership program, uh, as well as the citywide um, grant program, that those are low um, in, in amount of um, money remaining. So giving the review committee flexibility to shift the balance um, across to any of the five programs is something that we have done in the past. Um, so would welcome conversation and discussion about uh, how to manage um, the remaining balance of 228,000. Is, is there any possibility of using any of that 228,000 as a, uh, say a, a, a business retention grant because of the, uh, the significant impact the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is having upon our businesses downtown, uh, the ones that are, uh, are really struggling, um, any, any way we could, uh, could create some kind of a grant that we could use uh, for those with demonstrated hardships. That's certainly, Jill, go ahead. Um, it's certainly possible to do that. Um, we know that there is CARES Act money flowing from the federal government through the state to the county, of which there'll be a significant portion of money uh, in a business stabilization fund. Um, and we're waiting to receive more information and details as to uh, how much money will, will be available in that. I think we will know rather soon. Um, we were we um, tossed around that idea. Two hundred and twenty-eight thousand um, 
would go rather quickly in any type of business stabilization. Um, we can certainly look at it in combination with what we think may come from um, the from the county through the Federal CARES Act. Um, I, I personally think it's important to continue to incentivize investment that is still happening. Um, really open to suggestion and ideas. Uh, we are still receiving calls from people who were underway with investment in development prior to the crisis that still wanna move forward with projects. Austin, I, I think that's a good idea, but I I do think we should wait too and see what's coming from from the CARES Act because if that if that will help take care of it, then yeah, no, I I agree with you. Uh, see what uh, what transpires there. Um, hmm. Jack. So we're just going to allow them to consolidate and create $20,000 for, for an opportunity to write for a cable back. I only heard about half of what you said. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I can. I can. Combined, combined the is to create one balance of $228,000 to be used across uh, the incentives uh, in, you know, wherever they need them at, as opposed to the individual. Okay. Um, that is the staff's recommendation. Right. Um, Yes, so that would that would help our review committee um, to be able to have flexibility to use the full two hundred and twenty eight. Should something right. else arise, we can come back to you. Right, we're good with that, right? That's all I was asking. I'm good. I'm good with that. Yep. Yeah, I'm good. Can we use part of that two hundred twenty eight to tear down one seventy by any chance? No, we're looking to reinvest a little bit, but we'll let I you know. know when that goes. Okay. Stop shaking your head, Scott. All right. Uh, thank, you. thank you guys very much. City Administrator comments. Got you back on time, Mayor. Um, yeah, I want to do my shout outs for this week. Uh, first, I want to, uh, since Jill's still on the line and Caitlin um, may still be able to hear, and John, uh, big shout out to them. Uh, for getting turned around in a very quick manner, the information the city needed to provide uh, related to the CARES Act submission. Um, I, I think uh, we are gonna be positioned well. I hope we're gonna be positioned well to be able to provide some, some help to uh, our city of Hagerstown businesses that need it. And um, as Jill had said, we're looking forward to uh, hearing very soon uh, the disposition of that money. And um, we uh, we're going to remain positive on what that amount is going is going to be. Also, Michelle mentioned it earlier about support services staff. The number of calls have ramped up, and we uh, we are short staffed down there due to uh, uh, not having the part timers down there at the present time. Um, I anticipate bringing some of the part timers back to to deal with the phone traffic, and then obviously once we reopen City Hall at some point. Uh, we'll be back in full staff and, and I'll talk to everybody at that time about the changes we've made downstairs to increase the safety of not only them, but also uh, the citizens that will be in city hall. And again, uh, a huge thanks to, uh, again, to our staff uh, across the board that, that continue to provide the services that citizens come to expect uh, from the city. And, um, and we can, I, again, I'll say it every week. Can't, we can't, show any more appreciation uh, because there's just no way to do it uh, for the services that they provide. My last big shout out um, is regarding a news article uh, that was just uh, in the paper over the weekend regarding um, Rabbi Abby Pur um, Ari Post and our own Councilman Lou Metzner. Uh, we are very proud of their efforts 
to get 20 ventilators uh, to Meredith's Hospital. Uh, some of us that, um, were aware of, of what they had to do uh, to get these ventilators uh, out to Meredith's and the doors that they've opened for others in the state of Maryland uh, to be able to get this much needed equipment um, is, is just a, a huge benefit to the community. And we are very, very proud uh, that um, we can call uh, the rabbi and of course our councilman Metzner, uh, Hagerstown residents and their commitment to the, uh, to the citizens and those that need these ventilators is just, uh, is just beyond, uh, beyond awesome. So thank you, Councilman, and thank you to the rabbi. If you ever hear this, um, we can't thank you more than, than for what you've done. That's all for me, Mayor. Oh, happy Mother's Day, everybody. All the moms. Kristen, go ahead. I have no comments this evening. Lou? I just want to continue to thank staff for their hard work and uh, thank Scott for his kind words. Thank you all. Austin? Uh, nothing further this evening. Emily? Nothing more to add. Thank you. Um, just to echo, sorry, so echo uh, Scott's comments about the rabbi and uh, Lou, and also um, happy 52 weeks, Scott. Thank you for keeping us all, you know, very informed, and we appreciate all that you've done for the past 52 weeks, and especially in the past couple of months to get us all through this. So um, you're doing a, a great job. Thank you very much. All right, 52 weeks, that feels like it's been much longer than that. Feels like about a year, Mayor. At least, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I uh, uh, echo what Scott said and, 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 and appreciate the hard work of the rabbi. And uh, um, I know that that was a, uh, uh, a great concern he had um, from, on a personal level and on a community level. Also, um, thank you to all of our first responders out there every day, still pounding the beat, doing what you need to do. Uh, we appreciate you very much. And uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there coming up on Sunday. And a happy anniversary to my wife on Saturday. And happy birthday to my grandson, Bo, tomorrow. So everyone have a good week. We'll see you next Tuesday.